Good morning. Welcome to worship. Hopefully the last chilly day in a while. We'll find out. We have lots of little announcements before we get started. As you know, today is our administrator's last day in her administrative position, so we'll be doing a farewell from that position during worship, which means I could use some help answering phones and doors in the office. So if you are finding yourself a little bored or wanting to serve in a different capacity, please email me. Um, We'd like the doors or phones to be answered between 9 and 3 most days of the week. We have Wednesdays covered, but the other days are still up in the air, so let me know if you could help out. Um, We did kick off on Epiphany, our youth fundraiser for the National Youth Gathering that is coming up this summer in New Orleans. Two of our youth are going, two adults are going. We may have a few more youth and adults going that are considering signing up right now. It is $1,500 per person to go to the youth gathering. It's a time filled with all kinds of modern theologians that are keynote speakers. Um, They get to know a little bit about seminaries. They get to do service projects. And there's about 50,000 youth who attend um, the youth gathering every few years. It's a once in a lifetime event for our kids. So if you can support them, they have a sponsorship with a QR code in the back, or you can also email our youth director, Andrea. And then today is our super exciting budget and constitution meeting after worship. We will walk through our 2023 budget, how we ended the year, and we will look at our 2024 budget, and we'll get all the weedy questions out before our annual meeting next week. We're also voting today on our constitution to approve the updated constitution that was sent via email, which means next week then we get a vote to ratify it, and it's officially our new constitution. So if you're able to stay and hear about our budget and take a vote on our constitution, that would be wonderful. You may have noticed when you walked in, there's a sign for dinner church. It's going to be Lent in like two and a half weeks already. So we are kicking off Ash Wednesday on Valentine's Day, February 14th. And we will do a service in here for Ash Wednesday. But then every Wednesday following that, we will be in the fellowship hall. We will be served a meal family style. And we will have Holy Communion, a small service, and worship around a communal meal that kind of reflects the traditions of the early church and how they gathered to worship together. A sign-up form will go out this week, which will be helpful for those preparing food to know how much to prepare. And then this year, we're doing something different. We're inviting groups in the church or families or individuals who want to come together to come and prepare the meal. So you can sign up in a group for those weeks. Last but not least, we do say farewell to Melissa from her admin position today. That'll take place after the hymn of the day. Um, If you see her after worship, please make sure to give her a very large thank you for the four years that she has served so faithfully here. We gather for worship today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to rise as you are able. Our entrance hymn today is, O Jesus, I Have Promised, number 810.
blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, creator of darkness and light, word of truth, wind sweeping over the waters. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. God, our rock and refuge, we pour out our hearts before you. We have known you, but have not always loved you. We have wounded one another and sinned against you. We have not always recognized the Holy Spirit dwelling in each of us. Remember your covenant, renew your creation, restore us that we might proclaim your good news to all. Amen. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. God has spoken. The time of grace is now. In Jesus, the reign of God has come near. And by the authority of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are God's beloved. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray together our prayer of the day. Thanks be to you, Lord Jesus Christ, most merciful Redeemer, for the countless blessings and benefits you give. May we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day praising you with the Father and the Holy Spirit, 
one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite the congregation to be seated.
Okay, can I have all the kids who want to join me up front for the children's message? Good morning. Good morning, good morning. Who thinks it's warm outside? Oh, yeah. Yes. Well, welcome everyone. I haven't seen you guys in a while. How is everyone? Good. I missed all of you guys. I'm happy you are all here. So, this morning, no, please. I brought some glasses. What do you guys do with glasses? You put them on so sun doesn't get in your eyes, yeah? What else can you do with glasses? Yeah? Yes. Yes, glasses can help you see far away. They can help you see close up. Anyone else have any ideas? Okay, well, I brought glasses for everyone today. Hurry, Maya. Oh, hey, look, I broke one. Okay, can you guys all grab a pair of glasses and put them on? Just grab some. There you go. Okay, so I want you guys to put on some glasses. It's fine. Okay, when you guys are looking around, what do you see? Who do you see when you look around? You see your sister. Who else? Who does everyone else see? It looks brighter. It looks blurry. What else do you guys? Anyone else see anything else? It's darker. Okay. When you look through, if these weren't, you see people. Yes. Yeah, you're going to keep those? Yeah. I got to get sunglasses out of my house today, guys. Okay, so you see people. Are we all the same? No. no. What do you see then? Different types of people. What are all the people out there doing right now? They're just being themselves. That's a great answer. What else? They're sitting down. Okay, up here when you look at your neighbor next door, what do you see? You see her funny and her glasses. Okay, what else do you guys see? Okay, so sometimes when we're looking at things and looking at people, we see the mistakes they've made, the things they're not doing right, that they look funny or silly or weird, right? But God sees that each of you are the same. So when you look at glasses, he sees that you are all good and you're all beloved. So just like some of you guys need glasses to see, right? A couple of you guys have, I have, well, I have contacts in. Okay, please stop. Okay, so sometimes everyone needs glasses to help them see. And just like in God's eyes, you guys are always seen as good people. How many times do you guys look at someone and you say you're a good person? Wow. We're all distracted by the glasses right now. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> Clap them and wrap them. <laughs> Clap them and wrap them. They will. Can you guys get ready to pray? Dear God, just as these glasses help us to see, we ask God to help you see that we are all equal. Allow us to see love and compassion which Christ shows us, and share that with those around us. Amen. Okay.
At a time when visions are rare and unexpected, the Lord comes to Samuel and calls him to speak the divine word. Though just a boy, Samuel responds to God obediently as Eli the priest has taught him to respond. This marks the beginning of Samuel's prophetic ministry. A reading from 1 Samuel chapter 3, beginning with the first verse. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you, and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. together in my mother's womb. I 
will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful and I know it well. You have searched me out and known me. My body was not hidden from you while I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. My days were fashioned before they came to be. How deep I find your thoughts, O oh God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. You have searched me out and known me. Paul helps the Corinthians understand that God has claimed the entirety of their lives through the death of Christ. Hence, Christian relationships and conduct, including areas of human sexuality, are to reflect the reality that we belong to Christ and that the Holy Spirit lives within us. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the sixth chapter. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that whoever is united to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is said, the two shall be one flesh. But anyone united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Shun fornication. Every sin that a person commits is outside the body, but the fornicator sins against the body itself. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. The word of the Lord. Gospel according to John, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and he said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We found him about whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. Nathanael said to Philip, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated.
as you heard, our story today begins with Jesus going to Galilee, finding Philip, and inviting him to follow me, to follow Jesus. Philip immediately accepts this call to follow Jesus, to become one of his disciples, and then he hurries off to go to find his friend Nathaniel to tell him, like any good friend would do. And when Philip finds Nathanael sitting under this fig tree, he says, Nathanael, we have found him whom Moses and the law and the prophets wrote about Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. He is here. But Nathanael's response isn't what Philip expected. Nathanael is not impressed by his friend's words. He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth without even getting up from under that fig tree? Can anything good come out of Nazareth. And of course, Nathaniel has reasons for asking a harsh question like this to his friends. That might not be so obvious to you and I. Folks like Nathaniel thought that the anointed one, Jesus, would appear near a great city like Jerusalem, a site that had both political and economic power, a place that had a religious authority, a place where a temple was located. And so Philip, instead of arguing with Nathaniel for his response, for not believing him, simply tells his friends to just come and see. Come and see. And when Nathaniel sees what happens, he's surprised. He, in a sense, experiences an epiphany of his own, discovering that Jesus of Nazareth is, in fact, the Son of God, the light that has come into this world. But what makes the text more interesting to me is not what Nathaniel sees, but what Jesus sees. Before any words are exchanged between Jesus and Nathaniel, Jesus says, here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Seeing is selective in this text. This text tells us that we have choices when it comes to how we see someone. We have choices about what we prioritize about another person, about what we name out loud about them, about what we choose to share with others about them which can be very hard to do because we live in a very messy world and we're very messy people. There are multiple layers to the lives that we have any given day, multiple layers to our own selves. And sometimes it takes a tremendous amount of patience to sift through those layers that have been informed by the world around us, perhaps by the experiences that we have had or the people we have spoken to or the people who have spoken about us. It takes a lot to be able to sift through all of that to see the core of the person next to us without all of the other influences getting in the way. What this text tells us is it's that sort of sifting that changes our relationships with another person, changes our relationship with God because there's something that happens when we are able to see clearly. There's something that happens when we are seen, right? When we are known and when we are named for exactly who we are. In premarital sessions, I like to remind couples that one of the best things you can do for your relationship is to speak well of your beloved to the people around you. To speak well of their heart, of their mind, of their spirit, of their intentions, the things that people you know, bring people into my office to get married in the first place, right? All these things you fall in love with about another person. Because as soon as complaining about your beloved becomes the norm for how you speak about them, the sifting of the layers, including your own added opinions, can cause you to be unable to see the core of even the people you love the most in this world whether it is your spouse or your parents or your children or your friends or your colleagues. Jesus in this text, in this very moment, had a choice to make when it came to seeing Nathaniel. Jesus could have named out loud Nathaniel's cynicism and his doubt. 
Jesus could have called out Nathanael's prejudice against Nazareth. Jesus could have told him how careless he was with his words. Jesus could have named Nathanael's laziness for just sitting around waiting for something to come and happen to him. All of those things could be very true about Nathanael. But none of those are what Jesus chooses to see or name out loud. Jesus, who knows us better than ourselves, looks past all of those messy things about Nathanael's character and names the core of who he really is. Jesus could have chosen to name any of the other traits, but he didn't. And I can only imagine how different the story might have been if he had named those other traits, how Nathaniel might have responded, reeling back in shame, withdrawal, or embarrassment. Jesus chooses to name the quality in Nathaniel that he wants to cultivate and bless and lift up in this new follower of his, the thing he hopes that will bloom and grow. And that had me wondering this week, what would actually happen if we routinely saw each other as Jesus sees us? What would happen if we routinely saw each other as Jesus sees us? Perhaps beneath the anger we recognize, we would see a passion for justice. Perhaps beneath reservations, we would actually see a desire for connection. Maybe beneath bossiness, right, we would see a capacity for leadership. I got to check that one with Ada all the time. Maybe even um, beneath recklessness, we saw something like courage. We chose to see it differently. We have a power in the way that we choose to see one another. In the book Just Mercy, has anybody read Just Mercy? Hey, two of you. Awesome. It is about mass incarceration in the United States. It's a great book. I recommend it to you. And Brian Stevenson insists in this book that each of us is more than the worst thing that we've ever done. Each of us is more than the worst thing that we have ever done. Namely, we all deserve another look right? Something deeper, something kinder, something more full of grace, which is exactly what Jesus does over and over and over again to these disciples in the Gospels. It's in that gracious vision of Jesus that we are called to practice love, especially in a culture that is quick to judge and quick to condemn. You know, the experience of being unseen or even misunderstood or prematurely dismissed is incredibly lonely. And there are many people in our society who experience this every single day. There are few things that are more life-giving than being seen by another person as God sees us. So the invitation today to come and see is one that kind of invites us to leave the comfortable and limited vantage points that we already have in order to approach one another with grace and a belief that all are beloved, that all are made in the very image of God, and that when God created us from the dust of this earth, he said that we were very good. So may the God who sees you and loves you and calls you beloved Continue to open your eyes so that you too may see and love and call each other beloved. Amen. Our hymn of the day is, Will You Come and Follow Me, number 798. I invite you to rise as you are able.
I'd like to invite Melissa forward to come and join me. <laughs> We're probably both going to cry, so just warning everyone. Um, Melissa, as you leave the administrative position here at Capitol Hill Lutheran Church, we all wish to give thanks for your four years of faithful service and to ask God's blessing on your next adventure. When you came to this role at Capitol Hill Lutheran Church, we rejoiced to welcome you into the mission we share as God's people. And in this community, you have come to know and to share in God's loving purpose for you and for all creation. God has blessed you in this community and God has blessed us through you. So we encourage you to continue to receive and share God's gifts in your new vocation as a teacher at the Creative Center for Young Children, as you are still united with us in the body of Christ and the mission that we share. I want to invite the council forward to do a laying on of hands. Gracious God, we thank you for the work and the witness of your servant, Melissa Daniel Way, who has enriched this congregation and shared her gifts with her colleagues and her friends and her family here at CHLC. God, now bless and preserve her in this time of transition. Day by day, guide her and give her what is needed, friends to cheer her way, and a clear vision of that to which you are now calling her. By your Holy Spirit, be present in her pilgrimage, that she may travel with the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I want to invite you to turn and face the congregation. Let us give thanks informally for her four years of service. <laughs> You may not remember, but Melissa came on staff in January of 2020, two months before the pandemic hit and everything shifted. And so it has been a wild ride and we are so grateful that you stuck it out and for all of the transformation you have helped us do here. And this is a gift from our congregation to you. Thank you, Melissa. Yes, thank you. Yeah, love you. I invite you to turn to your bulletins. And on page nine, together let us confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we celebrate Christ embodied in human form, we pray for God's blessing on the church and the world and all of creation. Encourage the ministry and the mission of the church, God of truth. 
Let leaders of your church be trustworthy and accountable stewards, that all its resources and outreach bring hope and healing to communities. God of grace. Delight in the goodness of your creation, God of fig trees and fertile soil. Heal areas of the world harmed by human greed. Restore those recovering from natural disaster. Protect our forests and waterways and all the creatures that live in them. God of grace. Call the leaders of every neighborhood and nation to serve faithfully, God of wisdom. Give them visions of justice and unity. Lead them into action that promotes equitable partnership and uplifts those who are on the margins of society. God of grace. Hold in your care any who suffer and struggle, God of compassion. You know our inner hearts. Be present with those who are oppressed, victims of racism or cultural bias, and all who long for respite or restoration. Today, we especially lift in prayer Leanne, Gerald, Kim, James, Latdor, Vivian, Ingrid, Maggie, Russell, Malcolm, Brent, Vicki, Stephen, Scott, Oscar, Craig, Tessa, Jerry, Linda, Marilyn, Tim, Robert, Cheryl, Bert, Randy, and David. God of grace. Give this congregation the anticipation and excitement of Samuel, so inspired and empowered to do your work in the world, God of unity. Make us faithful as we build communities of inclusion and mutual care, God of grace. Trusting God who raised Jesus and will also raise us in spirit and truth, we remember all who have died and are at peace among the saints. Especially this week, we lift up Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose faithful advocacy for people and justice continues to embolden the church today. God of grace. Knowing that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us, we offer these prayers and the silent prayers of our hearts in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Friends, the peace of Christ be with you always. Let us share a sign of God's peace with one another. God's peace be with you who are worshiping today online. It's good to be with you. God bless you.
Blessed are you, Holy One, for all good things come from you. In this bread and cup, you open heaven to us. Meet us at this table, that we receive what we seek and follow, your Son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right to our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. indeed holy, almighty and merciful God. You are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, Our Lord Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, he took the cup and after giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give you thanks, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants. And these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and the blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all of your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. into one by the Holy Spirit. Let us pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At Jesus' table, heaven and earth are joined as one. Friends, come and see. I invite you to be seated. We do communion continuously here. Our ushers will guide you forward by pew. In our trays, the outer rings that have a dark red liquid, that is wine. The center rings with a light liquid is grape juice. We also have a gluten-free wafer available. Just ask your server. Come to the table believing.
Friends, may the body and the blood of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Giver of every gift, Christ's body is our food, and we are Christ's body. Raise us to life by your power for the benefit of all and to your glory, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to rise to receive the blessing. <clears throat> Friends, God who names you, Christ who claims you, and the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, bless you and remain with you always. Amen. A reminder that following worship, adults are invited downstairs for our very exciting budget and constitution meeting. Kids are kicking off program today, so they will head to the chapel for singing. Our sending hymn today is, O Lord, now let your servant, number 313. peace. You are God's beloved. Thanks be to God. Good morning.